Happy New Year to everyone. You're very welcome to our first webinar of 2023. My name is Sarah Brown. I'm one of the trustees of our glass. And our glass, or as we were formerly known, Action on Elder Abuse, will be celebrating our 30th anniversary this May. Um, our glass is um, a UK wide charity whose aim is really to put an end to the harm, abuse, and exploitation of work towards a living society which values safer ageing and allows older people to grow old free from abuse. It is estimated that around 2.7 million older people are affected by abuse, and that works out at about one in five, one in six older people. So it's vital that work that we do within our glass um, to raise awareness and to give people the confidence to recognize abuse and know how to report it is, is even more important today than any time in the past. Our glass runs a 24 7 helpline and it's the only UK wide elder abuse helpline dedicated to supporting abuse and their families and we provide a casework service which we'll hear about later in the webinar um, so it is vital that this work um, does continue. Today is often known as Blue Monday, a time when many people um, will start to feel maybe a bit low or lonely after the hype post Christmas and New Year but this is especially true for many older people. And research has shown that older people who have, um, who do experience isolation and loneliness are even more susceptible uh, to be, become victims of abuse. And that's why within our glass, we feel that older people do need a specialist support therapist to help them through the um, process of, of managing uh, post having been a victim of abuse. And our community response teams are there to uh, offer that support. And some of our teams have uniquely trained IDVA or independent domestic advice, or domestic violence advocates in place. But unfortunately, only six areas, mostly in the south of England, have these uniquely trained the support officers and really that means that for the rest of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland we don't have that service in place um, and without such a specialist service the needs of many older people who have been victims of abuse can go um, unnoticed and remain hidden so we need to work to raise that awareness and the need for this service and that's what's this morning's webinar or really focus on and you're going to hear from Isabel later in the webinar just to give you um, some more information on the role. I mean I suppose the other thing that I want to say is um, we know that a lot of abuse goes unreported and did a recent article in the Lancet estimated that one in 24 cases of abuse go unreported and that's especially true if the person the older person also has dementia and is unable um, to make um, their situation known to others so it, again that makes it vitally important that we have this service and the victims code is certainly recommending that local authorities should uh, we're trying to put in place support, specific support services for older people who have been affected by abuse. Um, and uh, obviously, Faye will be joining us um, as well in the webinar. And um, Faye works with West Sussex County Council. So it'll be interesting to hear her views in terms of how that service, um, specialist support services, can can be provided and it's something that we would want to see replicated 
um, across all four nations. In the future. Before I start to introduce the panelists and ask them to give us some information about their background um, and indeed in face case their organisation, I just want to remind everyone that we are recording this morning's webinar and it will be available to download afterwards from the Knowledge Bank website. And we would encourage you to, to share um, the webinar when it's available with your colleagues, people who have, have not been able to join us this morning. Um, during the session, if you have any questions, um, please pop them into the question and answer box. And Naeem is keeping an eye on that for myself and the panelists. And we will try to address those questions um, as, as we go through the webinar. So I could maybe begin by introducing um, the panelists to you this morning. Um, and then after the panelists have introduced themselves, Isabel is going to give a short presentation. Um, I expect Isabel herself to give a short introduction. Um, thank you. Isabel, you're up. Just, yeah, just trying to find my unmute I know, button. I know. It. <laughs> um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Isabel. I will have been at the charity for two years this April. So just coming up to my second year anniversary. Um, well, the charity's coming up to its 30th. Um, I started working at Hourglass on the helpline, actually, as an information officer. Um, but then I moved into this role as the community response coordinator for our English services. So I always say it kind of does what it says on the tin. I coordinate our community response services in England. Um, and we'll probably come to talk about what that means in, in a bit more depth um, during the Q&A. But yeah, I sort of make sure everything is running smoothly, uh, um, trying, trying to set up and develop new services in England as well, because uh, a lot of our services are concentrated on the southeast of England at the moment. Um, and I'm also delivering those services too. So I also do some practitioner work as well. Thanks, Isabel. And Poppy? Hi, so my name's Poppy. Um, I'm one of the community response officers slash uh, IDBAS, which Isabel will explain um, shortly, in the south of England, covering um, Pan Sussex. And uh, I've been in the role about over a year now. Um, before this, I was working um, in the healthcare setting. So, Poppy and Colin. Hi there, um, my name's Colin. I am the uh, Community Response Coordinator for Scotland um, with Aragonas. So um, similar to Isabel, um, I um, I have responsibility for managing our, our cases in uh, Scotland um, and do some of our development work uh, alongside our development manager. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that also involves um, recruiting and managing volunteers to help on the delivery of, of our services. Um, I've been with Hourglass for almost three years, uh, these three years in March, and um, before that I was uh, with the Salvation Army for 10 years, so um, yeah, so I've spent a lot of time um, supporting um, who might be considered at risk. Thanks Colin, and a very warm welcome Faye, and um, yourself. Um, Hello, good morning. First of all, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be a uh, guest panellist this morning. I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, my name is Faye Mills May and I'm the Domestic and Sexual Violence and Abuse Community Safety Lead for West Sussex County Council. So we are fortunate enough to have Hourglass in West Sussex, so we are delighted about that. Uh, my background, I've worked in the domestic abuse sector for around 15 years. I'm a, a qualified IDVA. And I did that for about 10 years. I'm a DA service manager and um, I was also a co-founder of the first women's centre in West Sussex. Okay, you're very welcome. Um, so if we maybe move on, Isabel, and if you would maybe present your short presentation just on the role of the IDFA. Yeah, absolutely, Sarah. Oh. Oh, 
Oh, I've lost you. Yeah. So yeah, I'm just going to do a kind of quick intro uh, into you know what an IDBA is, um, and yeah, what what we do at Hourglass essentially. Uh, so these might be some of the um, kind of burning questions that you've got. Uh, hopefully, some of these will kind of come to answer today, if, if not directly, then indirectly. What is an IDBA? Who does an IDBA work with? Um, you know, why are we important? Um, what service do Hourglass IDVAs offer? And maybe uh, many more. So an IDVA is an independent domestic abuse advisor or advocate. Um, so the A's there are kind of interchangeable. So we are specialists in understanding the dynamics of domestic abuse um, and creatively kind of problem solving and supporting our clients. Um, our key duty is to address the safety of domestic abuse victims who are at risk of harm. Um, so in that sense, it is a risk led role. Uh, we're required to um, conduct risk assessments routinely with clients um, and assess that kind of accutarial risk, uh, but at the same time, utilizing our professional judgment and um, within our glass supporting you know specifically older victims we find that we probably rely more than other professionals on that professional judgment when it comes to assessing risk in the dash risk assessment and escalating cases to marac and i something again we'll probably come to talk a bit more about but the bottom line is what we find is that the acutarial risk assessment, so that, you know, the dash that is used, um, you know, and standardised uh, throughout supporting domestic abuse victims, we find it doesn't effectively capture risk um, for older victims of domestic abuse. So, yeah, professional judgment is a, is a key player when it comes to the IDVA's role. Um, <laughs> I mean, just a quick reminder as, as to what we're talking about when we're thinking about domestic abuse victims. Uh, in England and Wales, we're talking about the Domestic Abuse Act. So person uh, A is abusive to person B if they are personally connected and the behaviour is abusive. And when we're looking at personal connection, it's any of the following criteria that are applying. Um, but essentially, we're looking at partners, uh, intimate partners, ex-intimate partners or relatives. Now, again, this is only in England and Wales that this legislation has been introduced and that's going to be another uh, important talking point uh, for, for this webinar. Um, so in terms of what our role involves when we're supporting older people who are experiencing domestic abuse, safety planning is, is a big thing that goes into that role. Um, and what we also find is we're having to kind of creatively safety plan for our clients um, because a lot of them, maybe they don't have access to a mobile phone. Maybe they don't have the finger dexterity to call 999 um, or they don't have the ability to mobilize independently. So they can't practice, you know, safe exit routes from their house. Um, so these are all things that we have to take into account. Like I said, uh, risk assessment, but also risk management, a part of that is safety planning, maybe involving uh, adult safeguarding inquiry. We might be looking into housing options, attending housing assessments, um, safeguarding I've already mentioned, legal remedies. So we might be attending court, applying for civil injunctions, providing that all important emotional support for our clients as well. Because a lot of our clients, when they come to us, it's the first time they might have disclosed that anything's been going on. Uh, we do, you know, education and awareness around abuse. Uh, I run a peer support group in Wokingham, which is, um, you know, a critical lifeline for our clients. We share our expertise uh, in forums like this, um, you know, in, in these sort of webinars, but also when we're going in um, to, you know, strategy meetings, um, with safe safeguarding inquiries, um, challenging poor practice from other professionals, uh, and also liaising with other services. Um, so multi-agency working is another really big part of the role. Uh, working with social services, adult safeguarding, community mental health, hospitals, police, housing, councils, um, and also friends and family of, of the victim as well. 
So in terms of how we work, we are a person centered service. Um, and what that means is we will only go, we only go as far as the client wants to go with them. We're not there to tell them what to do. Uh, we are there to present their options to them and support them in pursuing um, which of those they, you know, they want to essentially. Um, and why are we important? Well, we're independent. We're independent from, uh, you know, typical statutory services, thinking, you know, um, health services, mental health services, police, social services. Um, so often maybe our clients have maybe encountered difficulties with with working with these services um, and our independence gives them you know a feeling of kind of security and like they've got they've got someone in their own corner um we're qualified experts you know we've we have done the info qualification and we've got a, an, a unique agenda so compared to those statutory services we're quite fortunate actually in that in the way we work our agenda is just that victim and their needs and their safety um again kind of solidifying why our role is so important for the victim so yeah, within Hourglass, um, the Edvers work within the community response team. Um, and yeah, we're gonna come on to talk a bit about what that looks like. But again, we have, you know, we're having a caseload of upwards of kind of 15 clients uh, spread across the Southeast region of the UK um, and supporting them in everything I've listed really. And, and up in Scotland, uh, Colin uh, supports his clients on the community response program. So they're not, um, always domestic violence or domestic abuse um, clients um, in Scotland uh, and that's the locations that we're working in we can send these slides out so you can uh, have them in your arsenal there's a little map <laughs> um, and in terms of what we're offering this is kind of the service at the moment so one-to-one -one support initial offer of six sessions delivered over the phone um, and you know drop-in clinics and options for in-person support so I'll leave it there for now Sarah okay I think thank you Isabel. long enough yeah. <laughs> so back to you thanks a lot that's that's very good. That should give everyone a good overview um, of the, the role of the, the ADVA and our community response service. So we'll move into um, some questions. And the first question that um, we have in the webinar um, is around, and it's re referring to the Domestic Abuse Act, which is obviously in England and Wales extended definition of related person rather than only intimate partner and the question is being posed is do the panelists feel that this has been a positive move and if I maybe start with you Colin because obviously in Scotland this, you can explain to um, everyone why the case is different in Scotland yeah thank you so um so in scotland we we are governed by a, a different domestic abuse act the domestic abuse scotland act of 2018 um which does have some robust measures within it but is restricted only to um intimate partner violence um so uh so yeah it's it would be interesting really to i, I think to, to hear what what others have to say on that i mean i i definitely feel that the we're sort of missing a trick in Scotland with that one um, because it does put older people, um, many of the older people that we deal with um, at risk, um, at, at increased risk, I think, because they are not able to access um, support under domestic abuse legislation because in most cases that we deal with, the perpetrator is not an intimate partner. And do you think, Colin, that that position is likely to change within Scotland, within the legislation? I think it's. I, I, I don't. I don't see it changing anytime soon. You know, hopefully it will, but I don't think it's something that's going to be changing in the next couple of years. Um, but you know, I, I could be wrong. But I think you know, there's there's other measures that have been introduced to try and um, mitigate the the fact that that, that sort of gap is still there. Um, so the Hate Crime Act, for example, um, tries to address some of the issues around older people, but I don't think it's it's robust enough. 
Okay, thank you. And Poppy, maybe your view on whether having the definition of related person is has been a positive move? I think it's been a vital mood, um, a move for older people, really, in the sense that a lot of the cases that we see, um, we do get cases where it's intimate partner or ex-partner, um, but a vast majority of cases are um, where abuse is perpetrated from adult children um, of those older people. So that change in legislation is really, mm -hmm. it's been a huge move in the sense of older people can finally kind of access the same justice in domestic abuse situations um, now that that change has been made. So I think it's a great thing. Okay, thank you, Poppy. Faye, would you like to make any comment on that question? I, I agree with what Poppy said, really. Um, and I was actually, just as you were talking, I was actually having a look at the, uh, the, the Scottish policy because it's, it is a fascinating thing. I mean, in terms of describing domestic abuse, we do understand that those behaviours can extend to familial abuse, so family members. Um, and by not kind of legislating that, it really does put lots of people in a very vulnerable position, particularly elder people, because what we do see often is that family members who perhaps are taking up a, a caring role or capacity, um, often uh, when we do see domestic abuse occurring, that will kind of be the context of the perpetration of that abuse. So to kind of, I think the key word here is legislating it. So we understand that it, it happens, but in terms of being able to benefit from all of the support that's on offer, and that includes criminal justice routes, um, it's really important that there is that common uh, understanding. And it does, you know, it extends to, to other people as well. You know, we have um, familial violence that occurs uh, in communities. It extends to forced marriage, for example, LGBTQ plus communities. So yeah, that legislation has been a really, really positive uh, move. And I would you know, absolutely love to see that extended to Scotland. Thanks, Faye. Isabel, um, if we come to you, not specifically on that question, you'll have seen a few questions have come in uh, in the question and answer box. Um, and maybe you would like to address the question around whether you work as it was only with the client or do you work alongside other? It was and what age we were referring to when we were talking to people and the yeah. use of the dash. <clears throat> Absolutely. So um, yeah, do we support alongside other IDVAs or does it need to be your own IDVAs supporting the client? So this actually depends on the contract that we've got um, with, you know, whoever is funding the project um, regionally. So, for example, in Sussex, the PCC, Police and Crime Commissioner, has um, has funded uh, our presence there. Um, so what we're doing in Sussex typically is it's our advers, our glass advers, forgive the play on words, working with um, the clients in Sussex. Um, but we do find and we are happy for, you know, uh, members of the Sussex teams to contact us, ask us for support. Um, but because we're working in Sussex, what we find is that if there is another advers who's supporting an older client, that older client will eventually become our client anyway. Um, whereas in Cambridgeshire, where the contract is slightly different, we're not delivering uh, IDVA support directly to the general public, but we are acting as kind of uh, an, an, a one-stop shop advice hub um, for, the, for the Cambridgeshire County Council staff who are engaging with clients. So there's a different kind of tiered response there. So it depends on the contract and we can, you know, we can work either way. And that's, I think, part of, of why... Um, our glass has been so successful is that we can be very, very we can be very agile in responding to the different needs of, of different regions and local authorities. Uh, when you refer to an older person, is there a specific age you use to define this? So what when we're talking about an older person, we're typically talking about someone age 60 plus. Um, yeah, I mean, Again, depending on our, our contracts in different areas, that can vary slightly. I'm talking by a couple of years. Um, but yeah, we're, we're usually thinking 60 plus. But if somebody comes to us who's sort of 58, 59, especially to the helpline, you know, we, we don't want to turn anyone away. We we'll always give the best advice we can. But that 60 plus is where 
our kind of uh, unique expertise lies and where we you know we perform best I suppose did you want me to answer the dash one as well Sarah? yes if you if you can just yeah. bring your so do you use the older person's dash similar to the one produced by Cambridge? Yes. Yeah, so this is something that we're integrating now. Absolutely. Um, and like I said, we're working, we're working in Cambridgeshire. So actually, I think that's how we, we came into contact with it, but yeah, we, um, prior to integrating that, uh, Cambridgeshire dash, we had our own internal risk assessment, um, with a, kind of like a list of different risk factors that aren't included on the dash, things like, uh, caring responsibilities, ability to mobilize independently, um, whether or not that perpetrator is responsible for administering medication. I mean, we yeah. can already start to think about how, how these different risk factors play into the dynamic. So, um, yeah, I feel like we were kind of ahead of the curve on that one, but obviously great to see um, that now being standardised in some areas. OK, that's lovely. Thanks, Isabel. I'll let you stop there. <laughs> and we'll move on and take another question and then we'll come back to um, answer some of the questions that are being uh, posted in the question and answer box. And the next question for our panellists is... Um, why do you feel specialist services are necessary for supporting older people? And Colin, would you like to start us off again? Yep, thank you. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Obviously, that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of key to, to what we're what we're about. Um, you know, I, I think specialist services are are crucial because there are um, there are uh, there are specific risks that that are more prevalent among older people that might not be um may not be addressed by by a, a sort of more general um sort of response to 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 abuse whether it's through an, a service or some other um, type of support um so there will be particular health issues that, that might be more common among older people there might be um capacity issues that are that are generally more common among older people um and and what what we find as well is that um, and we've spoken about this i think in previous um webinars is the, the actual provision um for of support for older people is not always appropriate um so if it's for example um you know provision of, of refuge um services isn't always um ideal for an older person you know they, they might not be able to 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 move into a, a property on on the third floor, um, for example, or it might not be suitable for them to to live in a property where there's there's young families, um, so there's there's lots of um issues around the kind of the specific circumstances um that, that an older person might might have, um, and of course the the expertise that that our our staff our team can bring um in terms of um recognizing those barriers and, and being able to, to respond in, in a, a tailored way to, to the needs of the older person. Okay, thanks, Colin. Um, Poppy, is there anything that you would like to add to, to Colin's response? Yeah, I think all of Colin's points are, are absolutely spot on. Um, and I think when it comes to spotting the signs of abuse um, with older people. There are some nuances that maybe um, could be kind of missed in, in other kind of circumstances. So for example, something we see is um, any sort of physical abuse. Bruising um, can be passed off as unwitnessed falls, for example. Um, so there's far more ways to cover certain types of abuse. Um, and the other thing I think is important to mention is that older people don't always see themselves represented in the uh, more generalised services. I think a lot of it can come down to things like marketing and branding, um, where you're advertising getting um, support from a domestic abuse service. And a lot of people may see that as um, young women with children. Um, and then a lot of older people, um, a barrier may be that they feel they're taking up the time of somebody younger or somebody that's got dependents. Um, and it actually does prevent them from accessing those services. They don't feel that maybe that service is appropriate, even though they're still dealing with situations of domestic abuse. So um, I think having kind of tailored um, materials and resources and branding is really important so that they feel both seen and validated in the service. Okay. 
Thank you, Poppy. Faye, would you like to add anything to the, the comments? Yeah, I, I think that the um, the points have been really well captured, um, both by Colin and Poppy. And I think that there is something to be said, um, particularly around this idea of advocacy and championing particular demographics. And I think particularly with older populations, you know, there is sometimes a sense that actually they're quite invisible in terms of wider society. So I think really raising the profile is crucially important with specialist uh, you know, provision and services. And I think an interesting thing with older populations is that I think sometimes the lens in which they see and understand domestic abuse is really quite different um, to younger people. We have to remember that domestic abuse, uh, it didn't come into law, it didn't come into legislation until 1976. So until that point, it was something that really wasn't widely spoken about and discussed and, and understood. It was something that very much happened behind closed doors and people didn't name it and they didn't talk about it. And it was something that you just had to kind of live with and put up with. So I think the way in which we approach domestic abuse, particularly with older people is quite different. But yeah, the things that I thought about really were really championing, uh, championing um, and advocating for that demographic, uh, really valuing the sense of specialist provision and how they understand a specific need. And again, that building trust and rapport. Okay, thanks Faye. Um, before I come to Isabel, one of the questions that has come in is asking us, you know, to explain some of the acronyms. Now, I'm not sure of which particular acronyms, the one I'm assuming that maybe people mightn't be familiar with is the IDVA, which is the Independent Domestic Violence Advocate. But perhaps um, whoever put that into the question and answer, if that's not the acronym, if there are other acronyms, because I know we can all be guilty because we're so familiar with it, um, of using terms. Um, but please pop in what particular acronym is and we'll, we'll certainly address that. Um, Isabel, I don't know whether you want to add anything in terms of the why you feel it's necessary, you know, to have um, specialist services, um, because obviously Colin and Faye and Poppy have probably covered most of the points. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I mean, I I've mentioned something which might segue nice into nice into the next question, and I think. The reason why um, this is an issue which requires a specialist response is because the very nature and dynamics of domestic abuse when we're talking about older victims is different. It is it is unique and it is distinct mm -hmm. from younger people who are who are experiencing domestic abuse. Um, and I don't want to jump the gun too much and then answer the next question. So, but I <laughs> yeah. might I might leave it at that then. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, and just going back to some of the, the questions um, so that we don't fall too far behind in, in answering some of the questions. Um, a few questions, and I don't know whether if any of our panellists um, can answer this, but um, um, throw out a few questions and whoever feels they would have the information. Um, one was what provision for specialised advice do we have in Wales and my understanding is that we don't have that service currently in Wales through our glass and perhaps, I don't know whether anyone knows of any other service um, and uh, another uh, is uh, the question that um, someone is saying we know that women's aids are the lead provider of training for advice and that their focus is female victims. And as Isabel says, that might fall in the next question. But following the report from the Independent Survey in Wales, we know that older men are marginalised, re being believed, supported once they're feeling able to report. And what specialised training are we going to provide to protect older men? And I think that's a very important question. Um, so I don't know whether any of the four panellists would feel in terms of um, specialist services for, for male victims of, of uh, in terms of older men who have been victims of abuse. Is anyone? I can hey, would in. you like to? Yeah. Yeah, I can jump in and answer some of that. So, um, 
I'm not I'm not sort of familiar into uh, with, in, with Wales um, but what I can say is certainly in West Sussex um, all of our IDVAs are qualified by Safe Lives and um, unless I'm wrong Poppy I think that also has applied to Hourglass uh, staff because what we've tried to do is make it uniform in terms of commissioning um, in West Sussex and Safe Lives are an organisation uh, that they're you know different to women's aid I suppose in the sense of they do provide IDVAs also to male victims but I think what we know about male victims is similarly to older people it's a very kind of different dynamic and it's again very hidden and there are lots of layers around working with male victims so right from men being able to identify abusive behaviour through to men feeling that they can talk about that abusive behaviour then on to men feeling confident around accessing support services and then looking at the specific barriers that men face to accessing support services. Uh, so, for example, uh, being screened as a perpetrator if they're making that call. So it's a really, really big and complex uh, subject, but one that's absolutely kind of worth mentioning what I would say is in West Sussex we certainly do have services for men so Hourglass work with uh, male victims in West Sussex we have specialist male IDFAs we do have provision for refuge for um, male victims as well we have self-contained units um, and we have specialist uh, advocates within each service that specifically work with male victims, but also do some of that work that we've just mentioned around raising the profile and kind of championing and advocating for those victims. So it's, it's tricky when the main provider is a very gendered service. So I absolutely acknowledge that. And again, it is a difficult barrier. It's one we faced in West Sussex, one of our providers is a women's aid umbrella organisation and they do have a male IDFA. One of the challenges was we can put this IDFA in place, but will men feel like this organisation is for them? It's quite pink as well. It's quite sort of female orientated and it's an ongoing challenge. So um, I know that Safe Lives are providing training in Wales and I can absolutely say that because I'm doing some of the training for them so that is expanding um, and it should be the case that there are services specifically for men it's a yeah really valid and important question thanks Faye Isabel you'd like to come in yeah, I was just gonna um I mean yeah I agree with everything Faye has said there yeah and um can can back up that yeah we have attended the safe lives um it training not not the women's aid um I think from an from an hourglass perspective as well we've always seen kind of male and female victims of domestic abuse as equitable because again I don't want to jump the gun into the next question but um as as victims start to age, we see those statistics kind of, um, you know, pa panning out. So we do see, uh, you know, m almost equal numbers of male and female victims reporting to our helpline. Um, we don't screen against um, male inquirers um, for, for simply that reason. Um, but just to kind of answer the question in, in regards to Wales, we actually did a piece with ITV Wales uh, at the, the end of the summer last year, um, talking to the, the public, you know, primetime TV slot about how to spot the signs of, of abuse and uh, for specifically for men. Um, and so just kind of create, so we are in Wales creating awareness around that. Um, so, but something to maybe check out, I'm sure it's on our website, on our knowledge bank, if that's of interest to you. Okay, thanks Isabel. Okay, and we'll eventually move on to the next question Isabel was referring to, um, which was um, in terms of how does supporting older people, an older person with abuse different, differ from other Different types. Um, Bobby, do you want to start off with that? Yeah, that's no worries. Um, yeah. So I think some of the kind of challenges that we may come into, um, and this is particularly talking about intimate partners, is abuse in relationships and marriages um, will have generally been quite long, long standing. Mm -hmm. um, so they will have fully have fully integrated into each other's lives in the sense of 
Um, there's very much a house together, there's pets, there's adult children um, who often don't want their parents to separate in older age because that will kind of create complications for them. Um, I also think one of the biggest things um, and kind of linking into the, the Blue Monday theme is the loneliness and isolation that older people may face in these situations. Um, this may be to do with mobility difficulties. Um, sometimes it's a case of um, that perpetrator will restrict them from being able to access people outside the home. They may be completely by themselves. Um, and I think a really poignant kind of um, quote from a referral that we've had in is that somebody stated they would rather deal with the abuse than spend their remaining years alone, um, which I think is kind of profoundly sad. Um, and it does show that um, in older age, I think isolation and loneliness is so compounding that some people do want to remain in these abusive situations because that is their company, um, despite that company not being good company. Thanks, Poppy. Colin, would you like to come in on that question? Yeah, so, um, so uh, you know, as, as Poppy says, um, the, the issues around um, abuse where, where the victim is an older person, um, you know, there are often the, it is often to do with those kind of support networks and, and structures, but they, they, they tend to be more limited. Um, not always, but they can, you know, in a lot of cases that we encounter, the victim is more isolated. Um, either they have, that's been a deliberate strategy by a, a, by a perpetrator, um, or it's simply the circumstances they find themselves in, you know, their friends um, may have uh, moved to other places, the, their, their family may have spread out, people may have died that they have you know, relied on for, for company and for social connection. So, so there is, you know, that, that, that fear of isolation, but also the, the current reality of isolation, can both, uh, you know, can both be very, very real to, to the older victim. Um, and what we find as well is even things like sometimes, um, being able to, to um, speak to the, the victim uh, can, can pose challenges, whether it's um, through capacity issues that they are facing, whether it's through um, the, the fact that they, they are being essentially guarded by the perpetrator so that it's very difficult to, to have the, the option to speak to that person alone. Now, I realise that that sort of isolation can happen in almost any abusive relationship. However, I think, in you know, where, where an older person is the victim, it, it is probably more common because the you know the older person may have more uh, dependency upon um, a, a relative, whether it's the partner who's providing care, whether it's um, a, a, an adult child. Um, so, so that that is that's quite common, I think, as well. Okay, thanks, Colin and Isabel. I comment. Yeah. Um... I mean, I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, how working with an older person kind of manifests in the day-to-day -day role of an idver. I mean, Colin sort of alluded to it slightly there, but a lot of our clients, they don't use email, they don't have smartphones, um, they might not be very kind of tech confident. So when we're looking at how that that manifests for the older person and for us it means that we hear about perpetrators you know intentionally kind of messing around with people's with the victim's phone removing a sim card blocking phone numbers from contacting them um being able to kind of hack into emails um even kind of go uh, victims uh, perpetrators moving in with victims and getting rid of that victim's landline phone to isolate them so it's kind of taking into account <coughs> these things that maybe occur slightly outside the box you know you wouldn't necessarily wouldn't usually occur with a younger victim um i supported i was supporting an, uh, a, a client last week for example whose partner was tracking them um for a younger person uh you know it might be fairly intuitive how to disable location sharing devices on on a smartphone for an older person they they had no idea that client 
Um, so just sort of things like that, which might be kind of more straightforward and simple tasks for, for younger people, not so much with older people. And again, when we're looking at safety planning, uh, a lot of a lot of kind of safety planning um, tips online. They say, you know, practice your safe exit routes. Um, you know, you could think about maybe barricading yourself inside of a room. Can you climb out of that window that's in that room? You know, can you have your phone on you and call 999? Well, if my client can't mobilize independently, that's a completely pointless conversation for me to have with them. And similarly, if they don't have the dexterity in their fingers to use their phone or they don't know how to use a mobile phone and they can't get to the landline, again, a completely pointless conversation to have with them. So um, in, in these ways, it means that we have to work very differently with with these victims um and it, it's a lot about kind of creative problem solving isabel um, and if i come across Bay to you if you want to add anything that I, I think isabel summed it up beautifully actually i think that it's about um looking at the specific needs of older people um, and really kind of coming up with creative responses to, to meet that need. And I think those comments about um, technology, you know, all of those are significant barriers uh, to older people often. And I think it's worth mentioning as well, and this kind of slightly feeds into the question before around male victims and how with older populations, we kind of see that difference pan out somewhat in terms of gendered violence. So we see more equal numbers of male and female victims. Often with older people, it's not as straightforward. It's not as black and white in terms of power and control. And that's what makes working with older populations so complex often and really kind of reinforces that need for specialist services that really understand the detail of those situations. So for example, you might have a couple that have, uh, you know, largely had a, a very, a very nice marriage for many, many, many years without any significant problems. And then you kind of get to later in life and there is issues around two people that are elderly, one trying to provide a sort of caring role and being quite limited and restricted in their abilities to do that. What we see often is that whilst it's not a reason for abuse, it is a contributing factor. We see frustrations boil over. We see difficulties in being able to negotiate those responsibilities. And there are other complexities that come in, for example, dementia and Alzheimer's and how that affects the dynamics of relationship. So I guess what I'm trying to get to there is it isn't always a case of uh, black and white power and control, particularly with older populations. Okay, and just before we move on, I don't know whether you picked up the question that was in the question and answer box in terms of the training provided in Wales by Safe Lives and whether they're using, have you seen that in the question? Maybe you'd like to address uh, is, that. Is that, uh, is that to me, Sarah? That that question. I yeah, I haven't I haven't seen it. Are you able to? Is someone able to yeah, read me? Yeah, yeah. Just you, a wee second. Um, Safe lives are providing training in Wales, but are they still using the screening tool? If you know that, even though the EHRC felt it was indirect discrimination, and I don't know whether any of the other panelists have heard of that? So the answer to that question from my perspective is I, I don't know. In terms of screening tools, my understanding and my experience of, of having worked in the sector for around 15 years is that it, it largely depends on the organisation. So not all organisations use screening tools when it comes to um, male victims. So some will, and obviously it's been said in this conference that actually our, our glass don't. And as a local authority, that isn't something in West Sussex, certainly, that, that we police. You know, all um, agencies and services are autonomous in that sense. So screening tools do exist. Um, and they do, the, the reason behind that is sometimes perpetrators um, of abuse will try to access domestic abuse services. They will do that as a means to control the victim, they will do that as a means to manipulate outcomes for the victim. 
But screening tools aren't only used for male victims. Screening tools, perpetrator screening tools, would be used to gain further insight and, under, and understanding of that person where that professional felt there was a risk that actually they were a perpetrator as opposed to a genuine victim. So it isn't something that is exclusively used with male victims. It could and, you know, they are used wherever there is um, a concern that in fact the person is not, um, not a victim, not a genuine victim. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the specific answer to that question, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you, but I'm very happy to go away and uh, have a look and see if I can find the answer. Okay, thanks Faye. Um, we'll move on to um, our next question. And that's around um, what barriers may older people face to accessing non-specialised support services? So we're obviously not referring to the specialised support services, but um, those services, just generalised support services. And Colin, would you like to start off with that question? Yeah, so... Um... Again, I think you know, we've sort of touched on some of these these issues um, and with some of the earlier answers. Um, so you know, it may be around how how the how a service is accessed. Um, so most, you know, I, I I think most services will have a helpline um, that can be called. Um, but sometimes, um, you know, the some services will be much more. Um, designed for uh, a more kind of technological um, approach that can sometimes be a barrier not always but it can be, be a barrier um, I, I think also um, you know, where where the because of the, some of those those complex dynamics within um, abuse around uh, uh, an older victim um, so the the nature of that relationship for example that it has been a long-standing um, you know like, like they mentioned uh, just a moment ago about long-standing relationship that has suddenly um or or you know fairly recently um changed because of you know one one um part of the the, the couple might have uh increased care needs that they didn't have before which then can change the the, the roles within the relationship and can, can bring stress which you know not to excuse um abusive behavior but can sometimes be um, a, a contributing factor to it. Um, so there's, you know, just recognising issues like that might, um, you know, might, might make it difficult for um, for an older person to access um, more sort of generalised services. And also the fact that, um, you know, older people don't always recognise that, and not everyone does recognise that what they're experiencing is um, is a, abuse and therefore might not know where to turn with it. And what we find is that sometimes um, it's it's someone else that is reporting the, the abuse to us. But I'm not sure that, that would always happen. Um, and I'm not sure that someone would always go to a, a general domestic abuse support service um, to, to report concerns about an older victim. Um, I could be wrong on that, but I, I do think that that might um, again, be something that prevents that prevents that being reported being addressed. Okay, thanks, Colin. Isabel, is there anything you'd like to add? I think Colin sort of covered quite a yeah a lot of it there. I mean, yeah, we talked to we've already talked uh, you know about in terms of kind of marketing and advertising those services as well. Um, and I think yeah, what we find with a lot of our clients is they aren't always comfortable with the term domestic abuse they don't see mm. what's going on at home as domestic abuse so then you know to go and look for domestic abuse services there's there's going to be a disconnect there whereas if you're talking about hourglass safer aging that might speak to somebody you know a mm -hmm. lot more and especially if the perpetrator is their own child um again they might not be linking that to domestic abuse in their mind because that's only a recent introduction to well to public understanding um so I feel like those could be barriers to, to old people accessing support from your standard agencies. Okay, thanks, Isabel. Uh, before we move on to another question, we'll maybe address some of the um, questions that are coming up 
Um, and thank, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience who are tuning in because we are getting lots of questions coming in. Um, but a few questions have come in um, in terms of um, asking if the, any of the panelists would like to tell us how you manage or approach clients with dementia um, who are coming through for specialist um, support. Um, and I don't know, but Bobby, would you like maybe address that yeah. question in relation to specifically clients with dementia who might come through the service? Um, I think it's very dependent on um, the kind of stage of that dementia. I think working with um, clients with dementia as well, it's very important we build up a relationship with the local um, adult social care teams. Um, a lot of the time we will work in kind of partnership with a social worker um, in the sense of being able to provide more um, knowledge and kind of in-depth information about the abuse that they might be experiencing specifically as an older person um, and I think that really helps in terms of the social worker feels they've got somebody to lean on for kind of that expertise um, and at the same time we will still potentially go out and kind of visit people um, I've had clients for example who have been in very early stages and I've still kind of worked with them with that capacity being fluctuating but making sure to take into account the bigger picture um, and I think it's all about making sure that the services um, have a coordinated approach to supporting that person. I think it's really important um, partnership working and being able to draw on the support of other services and agencies when working with someone with dementia. Okay, thank you, Poppy. And <clears throat> another question has come in, um, which is asking, how we would deal with vulnerable or incapacitated clients who may need to have a court of protection deputy appointed. Um, and the example being where uh, someone is appointed under a lasting power of attorney uh, because somebody's been financially abused by them. Um, so, and obviously that is a situation that could occur um, quite frequently. Um, so, Anyone like to respond to that question? Isabel, would you like to? I can probably jump in yeah. there, yeah. So yeah. Um, in terms of our working practices, we we work with clients who've got, um, you know, dementia diagnoses, Alzheimer's diagnoses, um, to the point where they can continue to effectively engage with the service. And that's a conversation we will have um, you know, between ourselves uh, as far as possible with the client um, and with adult social care and adult safeguarding. When it gets to the point where they're not able to effectively engage due to, um, you know, diagnoses like the ones you suggested, uh, we can then work with, you know, a designated individual. So that might be um, the social worker leading a safeguarding inquiry. That could be um, a, a lasting power of attorney as long as that lasting power of attorney isn't the one that's being subject to the investigation. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to take it on a case by case basis and also tread quite carefully because uh, what we find is some uh, we get a fair amount of cases that come through the helpline where it's family members pointing the finger at each other. So we have to be quite careful in that situation that we are not equipping a perpetrator with information that, that they can use to their advantage. Mm -hmm. So um, in regards to that kind of sp specific uh, example you've given there you know if that client um, was still able to engage effectively with us we can we would continue to provide support to them you know we can attend court we can help fill out forms um, but you know if it gets to a certain point it might be then that we are liaising and advising the social worker or the safeguarding team rather than the client themselves. Okay thanks Isabel and we'll take a another question that has come in very interesting question and it's asking the panel what are your thoughts on the level of understanding um knowledge of what domestic abuse is amongst safeguarding adult professionals the data tells us only six percent of safeguarding inquiries are recorded as domestic abuse which i suspect isn't accurate so that's an interesting question for the panel um, Anyone like to 
a go at that. Faye, would you like to? Uh, I, I will. Um, obviously, I can only speak for West Sussex. I think it's an ongoing piece of work. So I would say, generally speaking, I think uh, it's quite poor. And I think it's a really, it's a brilliant question, actually, in one yeah, yeah. really worthy of discussion. Because it's true, frequently we see uh, safeguarding referrals not recorded as domestic abuse, where in fact they should be. Mm -hmm. So what I can and say um, about that in West Sussex is that um, we're fairly unusual in terms of a, a local authority in that we provide our IDVA service that works uh, exclusively with high risk victims in West Sussex centrally. So the IDVA, IDVA service is sat within West Sussex County Council and we centrally fund that. So we also have a MASH um, in West Sussex, which is a multi-agency safeguarding hub. And within the multi-agency safeguarding hub, we have um, members of our IDVA team, we have uh, police SIU, specialist investigations, we have adult services and we have children's services. So I think compared to kind of, you know, national responses, we're probably ahead of the curve in West Sussex because we, we have all of those teams sat together. So that means that there are regular conversations around who is best placed um, to lead on individual cases and what that support looks like. So there are always really good conversations between adult services and social workers and the specialist uh, domestic abuse services. But it is an ongoing piece of work. And I think that's where multi-agency responses really come into play. So it, it should be the case that domestic abuse services are represented on safeguarding adult boards, for example. It should be that adult services come and represent adults in terms of that social care context at domestic abuse partnership boards, which are of course now statutory in terms of the Domestic Abuse Act. So I think really in terms of improving the current state of play and, you know, I would make no bones about it, improvements need to be made across the board. It really, really is about multi-agency approaches. Well, and would you like to add anything that that question from perspective from Scotland? Um, so, I mean, in, in Scotland, I would say, um, obviously, with the, the legislation being different, um, it, the, the reality is probably those numbers would be more accurate if that was the, the sort of levels that were being reported. Mm. Um, I don't, I'm not actually across those stats um, for, for the Scottish um, perspective, but um, I, I would say that, um, you know, it, it's clearly something that I would like to be changed um, in terms of the legislation that you know we, we sort of in some ways we have kind of the opposite problem because I think there's there's a huge amount of cases that that we address that would qualify as um, domestic abuse if legislation um, was was broadened like it is in in, in England uh, to include the, the wider uh, relationship um, but at the moment they're they, they don't qualify as domestic abuse so um so they, they, they can't be reported as such in, in that way um i do wonder whether in you know in, in england where where the domestic abuse act does allow for for, for um these inquiries to be recorded as domestic abuse i wonder whether part of it is simply that you know and this isn't necessarily an excuse but maybe a reason that the the new legislation is still i mean it's not that new but it's relatively new in, in comparison with um the, you know the care act or um other other pieces that are more uh, established now it may just be that that it's maybe a new way of of understanding some of the cases that are that are being investigated um i don't know just sort of plain devil's advocate there maybe a little bit but it could be that there is just that um, it just still needs to be a bit more embedded in people's ways of thinking. Okay, thanks, Colin. Poppy, is there anything you'd like to add to that? I think um, Faye and Colin have covered quite a bit. I will say that um, from an hourglass perspective as well, one thing we have had um, an increase of, which I'm sure Isabel could probably comment on more than me, um, is training requests. So there are kind of social work teams and safeguarding teams that have booked in 
for training with us and have received training specifically around spotting the signs of abuse and domestic abuse in older people, um, as well as how to support them. So I do think it's something that um, people are aware of and that is being worked on. And the fact that we're getting those training requests is a really good sign that people are trying to make improvements in that area. Okay, thanks, Poppy. Isabel, um, I'll come to you. Anything you want to add? And if you could also, I'm um, just picking up another question that has come in. Um, how did you collect data for a successful funding bid for an older adult, which is another interesting question to ask? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, yeah, building on the, the adults, uh, the kind of awareness within local authorities about domestic abuse, uh, it, it depends. It depends on the local authority and it also depends on the individual, what that individual's level of awareness is. Um, I, as far as I understand now, new social work students are, you know, they have, they, they're required to go through a module on domestic abuse. I don't know how long that has kind of been in place for. We are working with um, Durham County Council actually providing training to their ASYE students, um, those are newly qualified social workers, um, on domestic abuse and coercive control. We've helped them develop that training and we're also delivering a segment on how coercive control manifests for older people. So yeah, we are getting those requests in absolutely, but I think there is a long way to go. Uh, in terms of collecting the, the data for the successful funding bid, we collect our own data on the helpline. So I did spot another question earlier as well about data in regards to being, um, you know, domestic abuse being an issue uh, perpetrated by men against mm -hmm. women. So kind of linking those two questions together. So we collect our own data on the helpline. So every time anyone calls in, we are re re recording on our central system the types of abuse that are being reported the gender of the perpetrator and the victim, the relationship between the perpetrator and the victim. Uh, and we centralize all of those statistics. And that is how we use that. Uh, we use that data to make funding bids essentially. So that, that question, oh, here we go. The stats tell us yeah. perpetrators are predominantly male, sons, grandsons. So DA is still a gendered crime. Yeah, I'm not gonna deny it's, it's a gendered crime. We do see more male perpetrators. Um, um, and you know fewer female perpetrators but again with statistics it's partly down to what we're looking for it's partly down to who's comfortable approaching those services and again I will say the statistics on our helpline it also we see the perpetrators becoming more equitable in terms of my own caseload at the moment when I'm looking at um, perpetrators who are relatives rather than intimate partners all of those relatives are female I don't have a single male perpetrator who's a relative. So I think it is also about reorienting our own um, kind of prejudice in approaching this issue. Um, you know, it, it is an issue where women are, are targeted. But again, when we're talking about older people, we are seeing those statistics um, being more equitable. Okay. Thanks, Isabel. Um, moving on to, because um, I'm mindful of time, um next question is around what types of abuse are seen perpetrated against older people which may not be reflected in other victim types are there any specific types of abuse which are seen more prevalent Faye do you want to start us off with that uh yeah I mean I it, it might be best to to pass that to Poppy and Isabel, just because they're current practitioners, so they can speak, uh, you know, speak to what they see. I mean, certainly when I worked as NIDFA, um, as I say, and it kind of speaks to the question that Isabel just answered as well. The, the detail of the abuse and the dynamics of abuse are often different with older people. So when I was working as NIDFA and working with older people, we would quite often see familial abuse in terms of financial abuse. Um, so that would be something that I would quite mm. commonly see. Um, again, I think it was Isabel that kind of briefly touched on it. So typically as an IDFA, we deal with a lot of um, uh, digital abuse. So using technology to uh, abuse mm. a victim, it could be stalking, tracking, you know, monitoring, all sorts of things. 
I can recall a case where the victim, actually who, who was a male victim incidentally, uh, with female perpetrator, was describing to me uh, the types of abuse that um, she would um, she would perpetrate towards him. And he um, was partially sighted and he had um, issues with mobility as well. And he said to me, she would take my walking stick, so his mobility aid, and she'll hide it. And I don't see very well. So that means that I can't get out of the room mm. because I can't see to find my stick. I only know where it is because I keep it at the side of my chair. She will come in and she'll move it and she'll take it away from me. And that means that I'm stuck. So again, we wouldn't typically hear that from a younger victim. Yeah. So it's these, yeah, these kind of uh, differences that we see. Okay, thanks, Faye. Colin, you want to pop in? Yes, um, I would just, uh, in terms of this particular question, um, looking at our own statistics, almost 40% of our cases are financial, um, financial harm and abuse. Um, and uh, which is, I mean, psychological abuse, we do see about a third of our cases um, would, would feature some form of psychological abuse, but the financial um, type yeah. of abuse is, is by far and away the most common. Um, whereas things like physical abuse, are, while it still happens, we're seeing probably less than 10% of our cases will feature physical abuse. Um, only about one and a half percent um, sexual abuse. Um, and and nineteen percent is is neglect, and um, whether it's self neglect mm. or neglect by another person. So, um, so I would say that that's probably different to what what you'll see in in more you know in the sort of domestic abuse landscape at large. Um, that you know the financial abuse is probably more common, um, in, in, in among older people than it is um sort of generally and neglect is is i would think more common um okay thanks colin um obviously mindful that we're coming up the last 15 minutes and quite a few more questions have um come in in the question and answer box um one has come in and just trying i don't know whether isabel you've been able to see this one that's come in from um referring to services that are available in Lancashire. Yes. The one missing service is the, <laughs> the older persons. It, maybe for others on the webinar, if you would maybe um, do an overview of that question and then is that something that perhaps our class might want to look to address? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We're always looking to, uh, you know, develop new partnerships. Um, we're really, really keen to expand our services in the north of England. We've been doing a lot of work uh, in the northeast of England, especially with the Northeast Adults uh, Safeguarding Board. Uh, and like I said, in, in, you know, in Durham as well. Um, so, yeah, if that's something that you're interested in, if any anyone who's kind of listening today is you know, your ears are pricked up and you're thinking, oh, maybe we'd like hourglass in our local area. Please do get in touch with us. I can pop the inquiries email in the chat box um, and we can just have some initial conversations about, you know, what that process looks like. Um, but yeah, very, very keen to be working up north. Absolutely. Yeah. And then just following on from that uh, following question coming in is whether the, the charity has the capacity to offer presentation community first responders in Cornwall so we're going across the country uh, <laughs> volunteering for Southwest Ambulance Service about spotting the first signs of abuse and I know this is something we always say that you know a key role in the charity is raising that awareness of the prevalence of abuse so that everyone not just professionals safeguarding professionals but members of the public and uh, families, you know, are able to spot signs and know how to, to report concerns about abuse and how to seek support. 
Yeah, absolutely. And this comes in, this is part of our safer aging agenda. We want to raise awareness. We want to educate the public on how to spot the signs of abuse early. So yeah, if that's something you're interested in, uh, in regards to having us come and speak to your organisation, we can deliver um, a free sort of 15 to 25 minute presentation on spotting the signs of abuse and how to signpost um, your, you know, the general public to hourglass, but also plenty of professionals access our helpline service as well so um you know teaching your staff how how to access our services too um again if that's something you're interested in i will pop the inquiries email down there and you can you can pop us over uh, a message and we can come and do that for free um other, we've got other training packages as well so if that's something if you're interested in something that's you know a little bit more meaty um you know send us an email and we can chat about that too okay thanks isabel for addressing those um and this will probably be in terms of the questions we already had, although we will still try to address any new messages coming in in the question and answer book before we close. But um, again, just a general question is, um, how do the panellists feel that the abuse of older people is perceived by the media and the general public? I think that's a, an interesting question as well, uh, you know, in terms of how do you feel um, the media portrays abuse of older people? Colin, do you want to start with that? Yes, yeah, so I, I think it, it's, it's a good question. And I think that there is probably a narrative out there that, um, you know, it's, it's being committed by um, professionals in in a care setting um i think there's so for example when i when i'm out um sort of in, in sort of public spaces um on behalf of the charity and um, trying to raise awareness and so on um the amount of people that will stop and and stop from the point of view of you know it's terrible what goes on in care homes um whereas actually you know we we our statistics will show that actually it's, it's something 80 like percent of our cases or more where the perpetrator is actually a family member, uh, a neighbour, uh, you know, a, a relative, someone that is well known um, to the, from a in a personal sense um, and, and related to the to the victim, um, and it's it's far less likely, certainly in terms of our um, service user data, is far less likely to be committed in those sort of environments and by by carers and, and practitioners. Um, so. Those things do still happen, but I think there is um there's still a perception that you know it's not something that is actually being committed by family members, but by um by sort of um nasty um care workers. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Colin. Poppy, would you like to? Yeah, I feel um, that everything Col uh, Colin said there is absolutely spot on. Um, I think there does seem to be a bit of a uh media frenzy around kind of care homes um and that kind of position of of carers being the ones to perpetrate abuse um i think i mean before this role i worked in a variety of care homes as a carer for about seven years um and care abuse does happen in care homes i think what shocked me when i joined hourglass is the um i almost kind of bought into that narrative um, and then seeing the statistics that our glass produced through our helpline data and the fact that it is going on far more widely in, in people's own homes, um, it was a real wake up call. And I think the difference as well is that people are far more isolated and vulnerable in their own homes because in care homes and nursing homes, there are regulatory services. There are people that are there to report to and who <coughs> have a duty um, to check up on these services. Um, and so I think when you look at that and the reports going in, um, at least people are made aware. I think it's far more invisible um, when people are behind closed doors in their own home and they maybe don't have visitors go there. Um, nobody might attend that property except for the perpetrator of that abuse. Um, so who, apart from that victim, is able to tell anybody that that's happening? It's quite a quite a scary fact, I think. Yeah. OK. Bay, anything you would like to add in terms of the perception of the media and the uh, general public? I think it speaks to um, this sense of invisibility 
actually for older people because I was just sitting here having a thing thinking can I sort of easily recall a, a storyline or can I recall an article in the, the paper or something that I've read that really focuses on um, elder abuse in the context of an intimate relationship or familial abuse and actually I, I can't I can think of examples where it involves care homes but I can't and, and the media is a really powerful tool um, in terms of raising awareness. When people see their situations reflected, it gives them the opportunity to consider things. And when we do sort of see um, abuse um, covered in soap storylines and, and bits and pieces, often it is accompanied by advice in terms of if this is happening to you, this is where you can get support. But actually, I think it speaks to the invisibility of older people. I, I can't think of, of that situation being reflected in the media, certainly not with any regularity. Um, and I think it's something that would be really, really useful, actually, in terms of raising that awareness. Because as we've already said, um, it's sometimes or you know, perhaps often the case that older people don't use um, or they don't utilize things like social media and uh, you know other platform, uh, other digital platforms um, in the same in the same way. So actually, getting that messaging over to older people um, is a is a lot more challenging. So during lockdown, for example, in West Sussex, we put signage on all of our refuse vehicles, so our rubbish rubbish trucks because we were very aware that there are lots of people, including older people, that actually don't um, see digital um, advertising and digital media. So we wanted to think creatively about a, how else can we really promote this issue and support services? And we kind of thought, well, you know, most people will see a, a rubbish truck at some point in the week. So we're gonna put absolutely huge, really bright posters on there. And that's what we did. Um, but yeah, I, I think it is, again, it's something that really is not in the mainstream, but really should be. Okay, thanks, Faye. And Isabel, anything you would like to add on that in terms of the media in general, public? I think another thing uh, that we've not touched so, so much on is how kind of ageist attitudes can manifest for older clients and... Mm. Um, maybe not, well, it obviously does link link into the media. And if you look at kind of the media's reporting about older people during the pandemic, uh, certain kind of buzzwords being used, you know, vulnerability, uh, you know, at, at clinical risk, um, and the public then starts to kind of associate these terms with older people. And I think even, even as practitioners, we can have a tendency to uh, overlook who that, who that person actually is somebody isn't just their age you know they've lived a whole life they've, they used to have a job they used to have in you know they they have interests you know they've got relationships that are important to them and I think sometimes these ageist attitudes can kind of cloud that and we can forget that there's actually an individual behind behind the number um and kind of not relating so much to the media but in terms of kind of professional attitudes something that I sadly my clients sadly report to me fairly frequently is um you know where they're going to access health services and they seem to just kind of be fobbed off uh you know because because of their age um you know they're not seen as kind of equally entitled to to health care um and things like that so yeah i think those ageist attitudes are something to to draw attention to thanks isabel well mindful that we're just five minutes left um just reviewing what questions have come in and um, one has come in saying that for future webinars um, someone would like to see um, the, whether contact denial with grandchildren on uh, the agenda of one of our webinars because of the further isolation that that uh, can cause so that's something uh, we certainly will take away. And an earlier question that came in from someone was that um, it was their perception that often older adults would be reluctant to accuse their children um, of abuse. And I, we know, again, that that is something. I don't know whether Colin, you would want to comment on that, but we know that that is a problem that many parents don't want um, 
and to accuse their children, and if not for their children, but because of the implications it could have for their grandchildren. Yes, yeah, and there's, there's definitely, you know, we definitely encounter that. Um, it is definitely an issue, and sometimes it is just an issue that we, we do have to simply manage. We have to work around the fact that this person, unfortunately, is going to want to remain in contact with the perpetrator. How can that relationship be managed in a safer way? Um, because they don't want to criminalise that, that relative. Yeah, and as you say, sometimes it is because of the, the effect that will have on that, that child's children, um, on the grandchildren. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks, Colin. Poppy, anything, final comments that you want to add on any aspect of this morning's webinar? Sorry, um, oh. sorry, no, I didn't did hear who it was addressed at, but probably it was obviously you. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, I feel like we've covered a lot of things. Um, uh, I feel <laughs> like um, it's hard to kind of pinpoint anything that we haven't touched on. Yeah. Um, I do think kind of bringing it back to the, the theme of the day with, with Blue Monday, um, I think it's important to look at all the people in the sense of the connections they're able to access. Um, and we also do a lot of work around rebuilding that person's confidence. Um, so being able to access local other groups and activities and actually yeah. re-engage in the community. Um, so although we do deal with um, abusive situations, there's also that recovery space, um, which I feel is really important to kind of mention and to check out our knowledge bank for those local groups and services in your area that might be useful to local kind of isolated older people around you. Thanks, Poppy. Hey, any final comments before we close? I think Poppy summed it up really nicely. Okay. Isabel, I'll give you the last word if, if anything further to add. Oh, I don't know about that's a lot of pressure, Sarah. <laughs> um, I think just if anything, if anyone kind of who's, who's been tuning into this today, uh, listening, if anything we've said has struck a chord, please do get in touch with us. We are open 24 seven. You can remain anonymous if you've got, you know, concerns and you just want to know what your options are. You know, we remain here for you um, and just know that there is help out there. Thanks. Thanks, Isabel. And um, if I could, just before finishing, just remind everyone again, that we will be putting the webinar online um, shortly, um, as soon as Naeem or someone gets run, it, getting it uploaded. Um, and please do encourage um, anyone who you know who you think might uh, find this morning's webinar interesting. And I would just like to close by really thanking um, Bay, Bobby, Isabel, and Colin for their valuable contribution. I think it has been a very, very, very interesting webinar, and I think that's because we've had such great engagement from people tuning in, um, raising questions, and that's the reason why we continue with our series of webinars to try to get uh, that discussion going and debate going and make connections. And we've had loads of examples of people you know, wanting to make those connections. So I think that's a um, testament to the value of the webinar. So thank you all for your time this morning. Um, thank all our participants who have, have joined us. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at um, our next webinar.